Can you guys hear me with the mic? Yeah, yeah. Hello. How did that go? Uh, my name is Sean Wildermuth. Uh, I'm an a instructor, speaker, filmmaker, spiller. Uh oh. There we go. The bottle was trying to do things. Um, and uh, uh, I'm really interested in um, technology. I've been doing this, uh, I got my first job when I was 15. Uh, I uh, um, dropped out of some of the best institutions uh, in the world. Um, and uh, I'm just really passionate about um, the people part of programming. Technical part is really interesting, but I, I'm really interested in, in how people, how our industry works. And so I wanted to start by talking about um, hiring people because I really feel like hiring people is sort of broken in uh, technology today. Uh, there's a, we're in a world where, at least in the United States and in most of Europe, there's a negative unemployment in tech. There's not as enough people to fill all the jobs. And what happens is, uh, because we're all bright tech people, we think we can solve it with data, right? Oh, let me parse all these CVs and resumes and figure out what skills are gonna be involved. And uh, I don't think we do a very good job of it, right? We, we, we um, minify the kind, uh, uh, we try to take who people are in our organizations and sort of uh, break them down into acronyms to figure out exactly who we should be hiring. But let's start at sort of the beginning. Um, when you're in an organization and you need more people, um, uh, often, you know, um, we think uh, that we can look at a project and go, this is how many people we need, we need these many resources, and so we'll magically sort of find them um, in doing this, right? Whether it's a short project or a long project, we pretend that people are just these resources. Oh, we need a UX person, we need maybe a front-end developer, we need a back-end developer, we need, uh, right? Um, it, it becomes down to these um, um, simple skills because we want to make a formula out of the project. We want to make some sense. And it, anyone who is in the room that's in tech knows that uh, the, um, planning a project is, is at best guesswork, at worst, usually wrong, right? Um, and so before you start to think about hiring people, I want you to think about what you're really trying to do because hiring for projects uh, and hiring for organizations are really different sort of ideas. Um, if you're hiring for projects, go get contractors. I'm not talking about hiring contractors in the same way. If you need someone to come in for three months that has some special expertise, go get that because you're not adding headcount to your organization, you're really adding uh, just some specified skill for some short amount of time. Because for me, uh, most, the most expensive thing in most companies is payroll, right? It's the biggest thing that makes people worried the most. And so you want to really invest in, in people. The, the, what I've uh, experienced in my life, when in, my, in organizations that I've worked in, is that we, a project gets behind and then someone, usually a project manager or maybe, or usually someone that's pretty far from the tech goes, well, if we're behind, let's just get some more people, right? And, uh, you know, I think, I think I stole this from the uh, Mythical Man Month, but I'm not sure. I've, uh, I haven't read it in a while, so I might have stolen it from somebody else. But this idea that, you know, you can add more cooks to cook an omelet faster just doesn't work. And all you do is get a burnt omelet, right? You try to turn up the fire, you try to yell at people, whatever it is. So understand why you're adding people. Um, if you have the team in the beginning, if you have the good people that understand the problem, uh, it, it then doesn't become about um, panic hiring and trying to find people and then uh, adding a bunch of contractors at the last minute. What's interesting uh, in what's happened to me in uh, different organizations is that they've gone, you know, we found these couple of experts, we brought them in for way too much money to help you with the project, to get it back on track or whatever the phrase is. And what happens is the, the like, leaders of that project get pulled off the project to get the new people um, 
uh, up to speed on the project, right? Does the exact opposite of what they think it will. But often, uh, you know, if it, often uh, software is thought of much like uh, manufacturing. You can't just add another line and it magically, you can create more things. Because software is way more ephemeral than that. So when we talk about hiring people, we have this notion of hiring employees. Um, you know, we have this idea about um, uh, resources. I hate when human beings are called resources. It really, really bugs me. Because uh, what you really, what I really want when uh, I've hired people is to uh, understand that um, I'm looking for people who are on the same track as me, right? I'm in an organization, whether I'm leading a team or let's say I have my own company, I want people to uh, be on board with what my vision is. And if they're not on board, if this is just a job for them, why am I hiring them, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, passion to me is, is such a big deal. And that's sort of a loaded word these days. You just want to find developers that are passionate. And that code word has become uh, has come to mean um, someone who's willing to work 100 hours a week and not get paid for it, right? That's, that's the notion. Well, we want someone who's really passionate about it. They'll take their work home with them and they'll, they'll do magic things for us. And uh, that's not, when I talk about passion, that's ex specifically not what I'm talking about. You know, um, back in the early, I guess it was the mid-90s when I um, started working on larger teams, uh, it was pretty common in Boston at least that they would build a team, build a project over like two years, and then fire the team, right? They saw them as these finite resources. Um, you know, the, oh, we're hemorrhaging money because we hired all these people, um, and forgetting that the three people they kept were going to be unhappy trying to maintain this whole giant project. And, and then you get eh, hiring contractors, and it's just a mess. Um, the other thing I look for when I'm looking for people isn't necessarily degrees. Now I have a skewed view because I've dropped out of many an institution that, well, I finished college in 15 months. I don't know if you guys know that. They said I dropped out, but I was finished. <laughs> I was clearly finished. Um, and college degrees, I'm not against college degrees because they do sh show a um, um, an amount of, of um, uh, ability to complete things and pushing forward and, and, and difficulty, but I don't know that they necessarily teach uh, passion and creativity and, and in some cases not even coding in, in a way that I would be, uh, <laughs> I'd be happy about. Um, uh, so I'm really hiring at the end of the day people. And uh, you'll hear me say that over and over again because I really want to get that notion of cross. Um, because when we look at CVs, they rarely tell the whole story. One of the things that I like or I hate about resumes is it means that people that are good at resumes look like they're better employees, right? And often the best people for a software project are people that maybe are a little disorganized and, and uh, don't look great on a CV. Um, and so it also becomes this, you know, you know those evil people that are really into big data and AI and machine learning. Um, uh, we actually had a conversation last night about that he wanted, that uh, Matthew in the back wanted to take all the speaker information about conferences uh, and then figure out what the perfect abstract was. And I think that's what happens a lot in, in employees. They're like, let's make sure that they have 10 years of Swift or 20 years of, of, uh, of JavaScript or whatever it is, these magic terms, which really don't mean anything. They, the, the, how long you've been at the same job isn't necessarily the best indicator that you're a great employee. Um, <coughs> because at the end of the day, uh, many people, I've done it, uh oh, this is being recorded, right? I, I, I've elaborated on my resume <laughs> about what my skills were. Um, and so you can't even really trust a CV. Like the, one of the things that I, I kind of detest is <coughs> um, when a lot of the hiring process now, especially for developers, 
has become these tests, these take-home projects, uh, getting in a room and uh, getting people to write on a whiteboard what instantly what they think, you know. Oh, you're good at memorizing syntax, but are you able to look at the whole view of what a project is? Because that's what we really need. We really need people have that sort of gestalt view of, of programming in many cases. We want to see where you your part fits into a larger whole. Um, so when I've, I've uh, done a lot of phone screens, and I'm looking, well, let me tell the story differently. I stole this idea because I did a horrible phone screen years ago. So I, um, uh, Developmentor used to be a big uh, uh, learning company in the 90s, sort of fallen by the wayside these days. But I wanted to really teach for them. I was like, ooh, maybe this is sort of the next step. I want to be speaking at conferences. I want to be writing books. And I, uh, I guess I should try to get a job at Developmentor. So I called them. They get, set me up for a phone screen. And they started hammering me on what I thought I was really good at. And about halfway through the conversation, I was like, you know, I guess I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm going to end this phone screen early. I panicked, right? And it wasn't until years later that I realized what they were trying to do was find out what happened when I didn't know the technology. Will you panic in front of a room of 30 students? And so I've stolen this idea that when I phone screen, the only thing I'm really looking for is for someone to say, I don't know, right? Because the scariest thing is someone who is bluffing. I would rather someone not know a bunch of stuff than pretend that they know everything. And that's... That's crucial for me because at the end of the day, language is language, logic is logic. Like, we're going to be continuing to uh, change technology as we go through, so it really, really doesn't matter. So let's talk about skills because a lot of the ideas around what hiring happens today is still really skill-based. Oh, we've got an Angular project. We need someone that knows Angular. We have a blah, 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 right? <clears throat> For me, skills are not nearly as important as bright, interested, curious people. Because the reality is that when you bring someone into an organization, the toughest thing they need to learn is your organization, right? You, the domain knowledge about what is going on. And that's not what happens in most cases, right? People think, oh, they're going to be able to hit the ground running. Oh, what, is, what are all these terms that are all over the code. Like, I understand the plus plus and where the semicolons go, but I don't understand any of the other language that's in here. And so uh, hiring people because they have specific skills, go get contractors if that's really what you need, right? Because that's, uh, that's exactly what, what, what contractors are for. But if you're really hiring people, um, whatever you're doing today, technology-wise, is going to change pretty fast. And if it doesn't, uh, there might be other problems you have. But, um, so uh, my resume used to be full of skills that, I'm, that I won't put on it anymore. Like Silverlight, <laughs> Crystal Reports. Yeah, so uh, uh, none of what I knew in my first resume matters now. And so if someone had hired me because I knew Clipper um, and I stayed with the organization, Hopefully, they're not still using Clipper. I mean, maybe they are. Um, and so, avoiding that sort of um, um, catch. You know, if you, if you hire carpenters, you can only ha build houses out of wood, was, was one of the ideas, right? Uh, I started working for a company in Boston, late 90s, maybe? It's all, the years are all blur, a blur now. And we had, we had one developer, um, they had been doing a lot of C++ for years, and he was incredibly good, but incredibly unwilling to do anything but what he knew. And uh, that was a problem, because the world had gone by, we weren't writing uh, uh, websites with C++ anymore, right? Literally, we weren't writing uh, no more CGI scripts, none of this. And so uh, he wasn't a good fit, not because he didn't have the skills, but because he was unwilling to learn. And that's, that's in w some ways, really devastating. Because in our industry, I'm sort of a model of uh, hiring people that 
don't stay for more than two or three years. That's become sort of a somewhat normal thing um, because it's never been a really about the skills. It's been about the company. Most of the companies I have left uh, in my career, I left because their vision changed, not because their technology wasn't moving. Um, uh, in Boston, I sort of became known as the can uh, canary in the coal mine because when I got fed up, either there was a mass firing or there was a mass exodus afterwards because uh, I, uh, I worked for a company named Vectus that I really believed in what they were doing. They were an uh, early uh, electronic medical records back in the 90s. These uh, um, um, pen computers that were about an inch and a half thick, these old Fujitsu's. <coughs> and um, uh, we really liked them because the, they were black and white screens and if you shook them, they rebooted, so they were like Etch-a-Sketches. <laughs> um, but they, when they decided to try to go after um, uh, um, advertising from uh, pharmaceuticals, I was like, this is the opposite of what you said we were doing. We're trying to improve medicine, not push drugs. And that's the sort of thing that, that scares me about companies. And now, I know the difference between having to survive and such, but um, when you hire people, having people, hiring people that know where you're going and agree with, with um, your goals as a company to me is way more important than worrying about one skill or another. And it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, uh, an egalitarian sort of goal. It might be we want to um, get everyone to buy our app. That's fine. Like, I'm not uh, um, uh, so much of a um, uh, justice warrior to think that there isn't uh, um, capitalism in the world. Just getting people that really agree with what you're doing and are not there to just fill a seat and get a paycheck. Oh, for a second I thought it, oh. it screwed up. Yeah, it's my, I put the video in there. I should know. <laughs> so when I uh, talk to people and interview people, what's important to me is that notion of curiosity and adaptation, right? Because whatever we're doing today, we're not going to be doing tomorrow. And looking at the, the, the basics of, of um, how they react to situations. One of the things that all, often concerns me about hiring people is what they're good at. And um, what I mean by that isn't necessarily the skills, but it's that you want these people that are curious and creative because they're going to bring to you instead of you dictating to them. Right? The first time I looked at Vue was because one of my students was like, I've been doing Angular, I really like it, but there's this cool Vue thing on the side you should really take a look at, right? Because you want um, inquisitive and bright people near you. Um, it's really important for me um, that I like the people, that they're matched with the people. Like it's, when I want to hire somebody, um, it really comes down to uh, I want to be uh, an advocate or a partner or whatever it is with them for a long time. Uh, and that means that, that the interview discussion has to be rarely about skills because none of that's going to matter. None of that's going to matter at the end of the day. Uh, what's important to me, oh, we're at 13 minutes. Um, <coughs> what's important to me is that we remember what our job is. Now, we've been, I've been told for 30 years that my job is to write code, and I don't believe that anymore. My job is to learn, right? And the output of that learning usually is code or a project or whatever it is. But learning, uh, if I'm not learning something new every day, that I'm not doing my job. Whether that's, oh, how this works or how that works, or how does your company actually do this and should we be doing this, or, oh, that's a cool feature of JavaScript that I never knew that I probably should never use, right? <laughs> Um, so finding people that want to be learners. The reality is that um, at conferences like this, um, uh, at, inside of Microsoft and such, they seem to focus on what I call the 20% programmers. And 20% 20, 20 programmers come to conferences, read articles, listen to podcasts and all of that. There are the 80% of programmers who go to work every day, do nine to five, do their job, do their job well in most cases, and go home and just sort of are sort of 
missing from that, from that ecosystem. And I like to hire those because they're not, they're not looking for the next best gig. Um, I'm not a terribly good employee because of that. Um, one of my early uh, uh, mentors said, just remember, uh, you're going to go in looking for a job and you're going to leave looking for a job. And that, a, as good of advice as that was for me, that's not great advice for a lot of people that are more risk averse than I, than I am. So let's talk about um, the knowledge inside your corporation. Uh, when, you're, when you bring someone uh, um, to a project, the biggest thing that's important to me is for them to first learn way before they even look at the code base is what your company does and how it does it. So I, w I was put on a job many years ago, maybe not that many years ago now, uh, when I was working for a consulting company at a trucking company. I was like, oh, I, it's trucking. I know they put things in, in uh, the back, they deliver them, how hard could it be? Okay. And it took me about four weeks on the job to realize what they delivered were um, tractor trailer cabs. Not, they didn't ship anything in the trucks, they were delivering the actual trucks. And so if you've ever seen like three tractor trailers sort of on the back, that's what these people do. And so I had, to, uh, I had all these assumptions that I was bringing into it because I wasn't sort of opening my mind to just absorbing and listening to what these people were doing. Because not only were they not delivering items in the trucks, but at the end of the shipment, they had a driver with a giant bag of tools and no trucks, because all four trucks had been delivered. I was like, well, then what do you do? The bags were too big to go on airlines, and like, there were all these weird things that they had figured out. And so instead of me going in and going, well, why don't you? I had to learn uh, to just listen, because they had figured out how to do the business. I just was there to try to figure out how to help automate and track and and uh, watch that business so they weren't losing um, tools here and there or the, the, they had um, um, airline flights for the drivers to get back to where they lived, whatever the case may be. And almost every company has this sort of domain knowledge. We kind of think of um, the projects that we work on as being kind of mundane and, and um, boring, but every company has these weird little blips, whether it's a new uh, startup or whether it's an established business, there is domain knowledge in there, whether it's in the founder's head in the case of a startup or whether it's uh, institutional knowledge. And so finding people that are curious about more than the tech is really important to me. One of the things I've always enjoyed is kind of learning and figuring out how these companies worked. How do you actually make a profit if, if you have to get another truck to deliver those tools back to your warehouse? Like, isn't that where all your profit is? It's an old book that I read, um, uh, like this sales book, uh, uh, Swimming with the Sharks Without Getting Eaten Alive or something like that. It was one of these schlocky sort of, learn how to be a salesman. Um, I, I'm not a good salesman, uh, just so you know. Um, but one of, the th uh, one of the stories they told in there really sort of hit home to me because what um, this guy bought an envelope company. Like, could not be more boring, right? They made envelopes, they sold envelopes. There wasn't anything new tech about it. Um, but he could not make money. He could not figure out how to make money. And he was at some conference and got one of his competitors drunk and was like, how do you make money? And the guy looked at him and said, well, how much do you sell your scrap paper for? Mm -hmm. And he was like, sell my scrap paper? I pay a guy to take it away. Right, because the margins in that weird business are just the difference between selling or, or having your scrap taken away. The envelopes actually aren't where the profit were, right? And so every business has these weird little things that our job as technologists is to help figure out and encode in some sort of magic way. I think I pissed past one, yeah. So I talk about skills not being terribly important, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, there are some skills that I do think are important, but no, they aren't technical. They're all those soft skills. Uh, I, uh, being able to communicate and not be afraid. One of the things that scares me most when I um, meet some developers is arrogance. 
because I recognize arrogance is not a problem in itself in that um, uh, most, in my opinion, most arrogance is just uh, insecurity, right? Arrogance is this sort of veil to say, no, no, I'm a type A programmer and I know everything and don't ever question me is about, please don't look at my code. I'm afraid my code sucks. Um, and so avoiding those sorts of people, but finding people who really can communicate. And I don't mean that an organization has to have people who write well or um, speak at conferences or anything. What I'm talking about is really sort of that one-to-one -one communication. And English as a first language is not important to me because there's communicators in, in every world. I, uh, while at uh, Developmentor many years ago, after I screwed up the job interview, I ended up taking a job um, several years later in a different uh, part of them. Um, we had a team that was pretty spread around the, around the world. We had people in India, Russia, Australia, Egypt, and I'm missing at least two places, but all around the world, different languages. And we had essentially a stand-up. This is a little bit before Agile became a thing. But we had this meeting every day at midnight my time, because it was convenient for everyone else. And um, every time we asked about things that were blocking, the uh, Indian team would say nothing. And then I would get emails at 4 in the morning going, uh, we weren't able to get done what we said we would, and this is why. And, and I was really frustrated. I was like, just four hours ago, you were fine. Like, why is this a big deal? And we made a decision to change the stand-up meeting to a, a group chat instead of speaker, instead of using the phone. Because the reality was that uh, they were afraid to um, use their English in front of native speakers because they want, didn't want to be embarrassed, right? They're afraid of their accent or whatever it was. And so figuring out what that communication on your team I learned was a, a really crucial. But people that won't speak up are, are just frightening, are just frightening that won't, won't tell me. Early in my, before, um, between programming jobs, I got this uh, job at an accounting firm I was just sort of doing data entry. Um, and uh, I was working on this big thing, and I thought I was being smart because I was trying to automate it because it's who I am. And I erased like four years worth of this company's data. And, uh, but I had all the paperwork. So I took it all, I snuck it out of the office, I spent all week typing it in, <laughs> right? Not, not a great idea, but it was my 18-year-old you know, uh, idea. And um, when the boss finally found out, I thought he'd be like, oh, wow, you saved it. You know, sorry. You <coughs> and what he was upset about was that I didn't tell anybody. The second it happened, I didn't go, I screwed up. And he said, um, I wouldn't fire you for screwing up, but I'd fire you for concealing it, right? That, that was the big, the big deal. He didn't fire me, luckily. But um, trying to have that lesson learned of people that will go, I'm not going to make it on time, or I don't understand this, or whatever it is. Um, I'm just going to pay something from, uh, um, from Google and hope it works. I'm not going to ask people to help review this. Like, those are the people that scare me, and that's why communication to me is crucial. One thing I learned when I was doing the movie was that <coughs> um, in meetings, uh, inside of an organization, especially in programming, there are often these quiet voices that just sort of let the meeting happen around them. And they often have the best ideas because we, as a culture, we sort of have this notion in programming that uh, the loudest wins or the people that uh, have good ideas are the people that are always talking about them and, and promoting them. And that's not really the case. So finding the people that can communicate quietly or loudly. Like, I, I want to make it really clear I'm not talking about just those eight type, A type, want to be in conferences, want to write the blog post, want to follow their Twitter account, uh, their twit number of followers every day like I do. Those aren't the people <laughs> you necessarily want. Having a couple of them is fine, but a whole team really isn't made up that way. <coughs> so I've talked about uh, creativity and, and passion. Um, a lot of developers I meet, they end up having a lot of passion for going home at night and learning 
whatever the new JavaScript framework is or whatever the new whatever it is, right? Uh, and that's not the kind of passion I'm talking about. Um, having passion for the product you're producing and believing in what you're doing is super critical to me. And that really comes down to people that have a larger vision than just technology. Uh, unfortunately, we sort of focus on developers that are just interested in the nuts and bolts. Oh, I'm polyglot, I know 12 languages. Um, have you ever seen a balance sheet? That's, you know, like, do you know how you get paid, right? Um, um, there's a pragmatism in it instead of this sort of dogmatic um, adherence to the technology that I think is just so crucial in most uh, situations. The people that are like, well, we're just, you know, our company makes money and they pay us. Well, no, no, that, that thing you fought <coughs> over for four weeks is the big contract that's letting them make their quarterly numbers so they don't have to cut staff, right? Having an understanding of something larger than what you're really working on, to me, um, ends up being crucial in the kinds of people I want to stick around. So how do you keep them, right? At the end of the day, you have these people. And a lot of organizations focus in on things like uh, training and adoption. And one of the things that I, I learned um, at one of my other jobs uh, was that you just can't throw money and bonuses at developers to make them happy, right? Um, I used to say that uh, a raise lasts two paychecks, and then you don't notice it anymore, right? It disappears into whatever your bill is. Bonuses are nice, but incentivizing people to like, if you complete the project on time, I'll give you this big check. Well, there's, it's not all just up to me, right? If my bonuses are based on uh, QA and documentation and the IT team deploy, like, then I'm just going to be angry at everyone when I don't get my bonus. It doesn't end up being an incentive at all. It becomes this toxicity into, into teamwork. Um, uh, and I, I'm a huge fan of the, uh, um, the, the, the desk award and the t-shirt, we survived this project, whatever it is, because it brings people together in a way that just doesn't work. Microsoft's really good. If you've ever been to the campus and looked on people's desks, they very proudly display these um, awards for when they complete a project or the, you know, the, the version of what used to be the box that they signed. You know, the, they don't really sell anything in a box anymore. But there's still sort of this, uh, that we're together and that we survived and we, that we did this in a great way. And I think that's important retaining people. You want people that are on the bus with you, um, whatever way that is. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't give developers raises or bonuses. But that shouldn't be the way you try to retain people. You want people that want to bring those great ideas. That's where things like training and going to conferences is important. It's not, about, it's not just about bringing new ideas into the organization, but also about encouraging pe uh, developers to be part of a larger, organ um, uh, a larger community. That's where good ideas come from. I've seen many of the uh, projects project succeed from a conversation they had in a hallway at a conference versus just the same five people getting in a whiteboard in a room thinking we're going to come up with this again, right? So um, hire people, retain them. Don't worry about their skills. And remember, they're going to need to learn. Thank you.